This is chapter eight. You'll remember that we left off where Brittany's mother had met this entertainment lawyer named Larry. And Brittany has just recorded a demo of a song that Tony Braxton had cut from her record. So Brittany gets it. And she's going to go to New York with the lawyer friend and he's gonna sort of shop her around to all these executives. So that's where we pick up. She says that the first executive they went to was a guy named Clive Calder, who was the record executive who'd founded Jive Records. When she goes up to see this guy, she is so blown away by his three-story office and the fact that he's got this little teacup terrier, the likes of which she's never seen. She cannot get over how much she's in love with this almost alternate universe that she has walked into. She just loves Clive. So much so that the you know two pages she takes to talk about how much she loved him and how he had this mystical smile and this amazing voice and that she would do anything to be closer to him is odd. Um, but it is indicative of who she is in uh, like many interpersonal relationships. Clingy, clingy. She says that she just loved him so much because he believed in her. And that's why she just needed to be seen by him and wanted to be close to him. But I think it's a little bit of an odd statement because it isn't as though she had struggled to get people to believe in her up to this point. She's had a stint on Broadway. She's been on the Mickey Mouse Club for a year and a half. She's won countless awards. She's been on TV shows. I mean, she's not a little nobody. So for her to act like, well, the reason that I just love Clive so much is because he believed in me. A lot of people have believed in her and have given her a start and she hasn't exactly been stumbling from one unsuccessful event to the other. She's had options her whole growing up years as far as what she wants to do. I mean, even when she decided to just up and quit Broadway, that certainly wasn't the end of her career. She picked right back up when she was ready. So I, I don't know about that reasoning. To me, it's more indicative of the fact that she's just desperate to be loved and to be seen. And, you know, she'll get that attention wherever she, she needs to get it. One of the things that she talks about is when she would go and sing in these boardrooms with all these executives in their suits and they'd be looking her up and down in her little dress and she would just sing her heart out for them. It doesn't seem like she, there was no fear for her in being sort of like looked at like a piece of meat. And, you know, she was also really young. She's 15 years old. You know, there are some people who that would scare. I, Brittany, I don't think is the sort that would have been scared by that because she has male attention is really exhilarating for her. I think having all those men with the eyeballs on her was exciting for her. And I'm not even judging her for that or, or anything. I'm just saying uh, Brittany was driven by one thing. And that, I think, was to be seen and to be known and to be loved. And if there were people who were willing to give her that, she would do a lot for the crumbs off of that table. Now, she goes on to say that that day Clive signed her and she ended up getting a record deal with Jive Records at the age of 15. Now, Mama Lynn can't come. Mama Lynn's decided to settle down and start teaching second grade. You know, remember she had, she had a teaching certificate, had taught before. So now, I mean, someone's got to make the money. I have no idea what's going on with Mr. Spears. No idea whatsoever. And so she can't come anymore. Um, little Jamie Lynn's got to stay back. You know, she's a school age now. So they get a family friend called Felicia Collada to come. She always called her Miss Fee. She said the label wanted me in the studio immediately. They put Fee and me up in an apartment in New York and we would drive to New Jersey every day and I'd go into a booth and I'd sing for producer and songwriter Eric Foster White, who'd worked with Whitney Houston. She says, honestly, I was clueless. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I loved to sing and I loved to dance. So whichever of the gods could come down and coordinate that for me, I was gonna show up for them. If anyone was able to put something together for me that presented me in a format people could relate to, I was ready. I don't know what happened, but God worked his magic and there I was in New Jersey recording. I don't know if it was God or the devil, but. Anyway, she's going to, under this booth and she's singing every day and like from slap sun up to sundown, she's in that booth and she won't quit for anything. And people are like, hey, let's take a break. <clears throat> not Brittany. She's not, she's not taking a break. Now she says, this is just, this is a, this is a real question mark to me. Y'all let me know what you think about this. Of course, being the pop singer that she is, who do you think they want her to get to know? There's only one person to know if you are a pop singer. So they tell her they want her to get to know this producer from Sweden. And they tell her he's really good. He writes really cool songs. And she says, okay, well, Who's he worked with? And she says, even now she looks back and is surprised that she knew to ask that question. 
Um, but she had a really clear idea about what she wanted to sound like. So she wanted to work with people who could create that sound for her. And she was told that he'd done song for the Backstreet Boys, Robin and Brian a Adams. So she said, okay, I'll do it. And who do you think they flew in? Max Martin. Max Martin has written songs for every single person that you've ever heard of in your whole life. Every little pop singer that's on the radio in the last, I don't know, 30 years, Max Martin's been, you know, had his hand in it. I don't know what they're paying that guy. But anyway, he flies in from Sweden. But what's really weird to me is that usually she had handlers and assistants because of her age. She didn't go anywhere by herself. But they said, Max Martin wants to meet with you by himself. So you guys are going to go to dinner together alone. She's 15. Why did he want to go to dinner with her alone? I'm not, I, I, I'm not even alluding to anything. I don't have like any like, you know, hot take on this necessarily. I just think it's, it's interesting that they would want her to meet alone with him. Like, I don't understand why that was a necessary element. Anyway, she says they sit down to the restaurant and somehow the table goes up in flame. There's a little candle there and the waitress, I think accidentally put like the drink menu in the flames or something. So they immediately leap up and they, you know, they just go. And she says that it was just magic. He was magic and they started working together. And shortly after that, she flew to Sweden where she could record there. She said, honestly, it didn't really feel any different than New Jersey because she was in that booth from dawn until dark. Same, same situation. She would not stop. She said that Miss Fee would try to get her to come in, come get some coffee, let's take a break. No, 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 says Brittany. She worked for hours straight. She said her work ethic was strong. I would never come out. If you knew me then, you wouldn't hear from me for days. I would stay in the studio as long as I could. And if anybody wanted to leave, I'd say I wasn't perfect. She says the night that they recorded Baby One More Time, she had been listening to Soft Cell's Tainted Love and she really loved the sound on that song. So she intentionally stayed up way later than she usually would because she wanted to get her voice really kind of tired and gravelly and she thought that was a really sexy sound. So she says it worked. She said, when I sang, my voice came out gravelly in a way that sounded more mature and sexier. She's 15. Why is she so consumed with being mature and sexy. I mean, here's, here's the thing. I was 15 one time too. It's, it's crazy to me how, how much you want to be perceived as a woman. The problem is, is that there's been no guidance on how to do that in a way that still keeps your dignity intact. You can still be beautiful. You can still be sexy and you can still be respected, but nobody taught her how to do that. So she says that when the songs were done, someone said, well, what, what else can you do? Do you want to dance now? And she says, do I want to dance? Hell yeah, I do. So then we go into the making of Baby One More Time. And it's interesting. Um, I don't know that I'm going to read it word for word. I'll just tell it to you. She says that the original concept for Baby One More Time was some kind of futuristic situation in which she was in some kind of Power Rangers outfit. And she said she thought that was lame and that her audience would not relate to that. And so she's the one who came up with the concept of being at school. She was the one who came up with the concept of them being in their school uniforms um, so that there would be a contrast when they go out and they're dancing in their street clothes. And so she said that they were really awesome in letting her have a say in how that video went. This is the most interesting thing about it though. She says, that's probably the moment in my life when I had the most passion for music. I was unknown and I had nothing to lose if I messed up. There's so much freedom in being anonymous. I could look at a, a crowd who'd never seen me before and think, you don't know who I am yet. It was kind of liberating that I didn't really have to care if I made mistakes. She says that for her, performing wasn't about smiling and posing. She almost looked at it like a sport. In the same way her dad had driven her brother relentlessly in sports, that's kind of the way she drove herself in music. She kind of had her dad's voice in her head all the time, just pushing, pushing, pushing her. Now, after she recorded the song, she had to go on, the, on this mall tour. It sounds ridiculous. I mean, so lame. And she had to go to like 26 malls and sort of try to sell her song, but nobody knew her yet. No one knew the song yet. So, I mean, it was pretty embarrassing. Um, but she says that when she was 16, the Baby One More Time single hit stores. The next month, the video premiered, and suddenly I was getting recognized everywhere I went. On January 12, 1999, the album came out and sold over 10 million copies very quickly. I debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 chart in the U.S., and I became the first woman to debut with a number one single and album at the same time. I was so happy, and I could feel my life starting to open up. I didn't have to perform in malls anymore.
she toured with NSYNC uh, right after that, which is when she kind of got to hang out with Justin Timberlake again. And she said that at that time, she was always with her dancers or Felicia or one of her two managers, Larry Rudolph and Johnny Wright. She said, I acquired a security guard named Big Rob, who was unbelievably sweet to me. Everything has changed. You know, she was a little nobody from Louisiana before, you know, and being on the Mickey Mouse Club isn't nothing, but I mean, it's no solo career. And now suddenly she's like one of the most recognizable names in America. And I mean, it just, when you have gotten to the point where you've got to have your own security team, things have gotten real. She said she became a regular on MTV's Toe Request Live. She said Rolling Stone sent David LaChapelle to Louisiana to shoot her for the April cover. Um, and the story was called Inside the Heart, Mind, and Bedroom of a Teen Dream. When the magazine came out, the photos were controversial because the cover shot of me in my underwear holding a Teletubby played up how young I was. My mother seemed concerned, but I knew that I wanted to work with David LaChapelle again. See, this is what I'm saying to you. I said this in the previous video. I'll say this in this video. She does not understand how exploited she is being and how twisted they're taking it with her sexuality and her being so young. Those photos are so weird. There she is standing in like straight lingerie in her bedroom that it's like, it's her legitimate bedroom. It's all of her old dolls that she used to have. It's her laying on her bed with a Teletubby. I mean, it's in bra and panties. Why in the world is she in her panties? Why did that need to happen? Right? I, I have no idea. And her mom, like I said last time, all her mom's like, I don't know if I like this. I don't think this is, this, this feels kind of funny, Brittany. We, do we want this? And Brittany's always like, yes, I want to work with that guy again. He made me feel sexy. And so her mom's like, okay, well, if that's what you want to do. No, but it's like, is anybody going to put the brakes on this? If I, uh, okay. In the wild, wacky world in which if my daughter ever became really well known out of nowhere, suddenly, which would never happen because I would lay down and die before that happened for her sake. But a photographer came up in my house and was like, okay, now for this shoot, we're gonna have you take off all your clothes, stand in your panties and, you know, surround yourself with dolls. I'd be like, there's a door, sir. Don't ever show your face here again. I mean, I, I, can you even imagine? Where was Lynn? Well, David's in there clicking away, at, you know, surrounding her with Teletubby dolls and, and these little porcelain baby dolls. Where's Lynn? Quite frankly, where's Jamie the dad? When's he ever gonna show his face? When uh, He's gonna show his face when he thinks it's time to line his own pocket. Why isn't he up in that place being like, ripping that photographer right out of that bedroom and being like, Brittany, put some clothes on and you get out of here. Her parents don't care about her, like at all. Anyway, every day was something new, she says. She said she was constantly meeting all these really exciting people. And that at one point she met songwriter and singer Paula Cole at a party in New York. She said that Paula was 14 years older than her, but she just loved her so much. Just her look. Brittany was like just all over her look. She says she was the smallest thing with the curliest brown hair flowing down her back. I had no idea who the hell she was, only that she was beautiful with this incredible look and energy. Years later, I figured out that she was also the singer of songs I loved. When I first heard her voice, I thought she looked completely different than what she actually did. Putting her angelic face to her super dirty words on feeling love, her tiny body with the strength of her voice on I don't want to wait, I realized how powerful it can be to when women defy expectations. And really, this is like what I'm talking about when I say she's desperately looking for some kind of a guidance on how to be in this world. You know, it's just so strange, strange goals. I mean, there's just this feeling like she's groping for a set of values, some kind of principles, some kind of a way to be, you know, and it's like, oh, so I can, you know, I can sing really dirty lyrics and still be like girly, girly. Okay, maybe that's a way I can be. You know, like I, I can defy expectations. I can look innocent, but also be really edgy. Maybe that's a thing I can do. And she's just all the day looking around for a way to be. And sadly, there's just not a lot of role models out there that are showing her a positive way to be. So chapter 10, Justin Timberlake enters the picture. Justin Timberlake and I stayed in touch after the Mickey Mouse Club and we enjoyed spending time together on the NSYNC tour. Having shared that experience at such a young age gave us a shorthand. We had so much in common. We met up when I was on tour and started hanging out during the day before shows and then after shows too. And pretty soon I realized that I was head over heels in love with him. So in love with him, it was pathetic. When he and I were anywhere in the same vicinity, his mom even said this, we were like magnets. We just find each other immediately and stick together. 
You couldn't explain the way we were together. It was weird, to be honest, how in love we were. His band NSYNC was what people back then called So Pimp. They were white boys, but they loved hip hop. To me, that's what separated them from the Backstreet Boys, who seemed very conscientiously to position themselves as a white group. Okay, you guys, just a second. Just sit down. I had not heard this part of the book yet. Apparently, this was a big part of the book. Like, everyone was laughing at this part. This was new to me, and I busted out when I first read this, because it is so lame. This is where I was already like, Justin, I never liked you. Now, I really don't like you. Okay, get ready. So she says NSYNC was a white group that was all about the hip hop, right? Okay, I'm not against people. Like, let's mix genres, okay? Like, let's, you can do your thing. Do your thing if you want to. Just because you're white doesn't mean you can't like hip hop. Same, you know, same thing. Like when I read the Jada book and she's like, I was black, but I really like heavy metal. Okay, that's not a thing. You can do whatever you want. Can you do this next thing though? No. Uh, so she says that NSYNC hung out with black artists. Sometimes I thought they tried too hard to fit in. You can say that again. One day, Jay and I were in New York, going to parts of town I'd never been to before. Walking our way was a guy with a huge blinged out medallion. He was flanked by two giant security guards. I, Jay got all excited and said so loud, Oh yeah, faux shiz, faux shiz, genuine, what's up, homie? I mean, <laughs> that is so lame. That is so embarrassing. I could hardly read it. I mean, I feel like my face is red even as we speak. Anyway, after genuine walked away, Felicia did an impression of Jay. Oh yeah, faux shiz, faux shiz, genuine. Jay wasn't even embarrassed. He, he just took it and looked at her like, okay, F you, Fee. I think Jay did care if he's going to shoot Fee a look like that, but whatever. Anyway, that was the trip where he got his first necklace, a big T for Timberlake. I had a hard time being as carefree as he seemed. I couldn't help but notice that the questions he got asked by talk show hosts were different from the ones they asked me. Everyone kept making strange comments about my breasts, wanting to know whether or not I had had plastic surgery. What if sometimes if talk show hosts and things like that demean women in a way they don't demean men because women do have incredible power because they're so beautiful. Like a woman's beauty, I think, is debilitating to a man. I think some men resent the fact that beautiful women disarm them. And so if they can belittle a woman to make it seem as though she's nothing more than a pair of breasts, then they feel like they can get their power back from having been sort of distracted and taken aback by how beautiful she is, you know? And I'm not saying that that's like always true, but I feel like that's one of the reasons why women are so many times degraded and sort of just reduced to their body. I think it's a way of attacking beauty. I think beauty can scare people because it's something that they want that they can't have and they don't like that feeling. So just degrade it. It's almost like sour grapes in a way. Anyway, continuing, that's a side note. Press could be uncomfortable, but at award show, I felt real joy. The child in me got a thrill seeing Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. And it was also exciting, she says, when Lenny Kravitz came in. She kept thinking, legends, legends everywhere I look. And she started running into Madonna all over the world. I mean, her life is just changing at a rapid pace. She said, I would do shows in Germany and Italy and we'd end up performing at the same European awards show. We'd greet each other as friends. She says, at one award show, I knocked on Mariah Carey's dressing room door. She opened it and out poured the most beautiful otherworldly light. You know how we all have ring lights now? Well, more than 20 years ago, only Mariah Carey knew about ring lights. And no, I don't just say her first name. To me, she's always going to be Mariah Carey. I asked if we could take a photo together and tried to take one where we were standing. And she said, no, no, come stand there here, darling. This is my light. This is my side. I want you to stand here so I can get on my good side, girl. She kept saying that in her deep, beautiful voice. My good side girl, my good side girl. I did everything Mariah told me to do. And we took the photo. Of course, she was completely right about everything. The photo looked incredible. I know I won an award that night, but I couldn't even tell you what it was. The perfect photo was Mariah Carey. That was the real prize. See, this is what I am saying to you. Brittany does not understand that she adds value, that people would want to know her that the way she idolizes Mariah Carey would be the way people would idolize her. Brittany just wanders through the world 
sort of honestly thinking of herself as an afterthought of something that nobody would really want as like somebody who's like singing and dancing but like she doesn't seem to understand that her fame is a representative of how much people like her even if she knows that intellectually she does not know that in her real being she, she seems to believe that this legend can tell her what to do and when to do it and how to do it and I, you know i'm not saying you have to walk into somebody's dressing room and be objectionable or you know, pick a fight or be like, no, we're not standing. I'm not saying that, but the way she idolizes Mariah Carey, as though Mariah Carey had the right, um, had the, the hierarchy says that Mariah can talk to her that way and that she accepts it and not only accepts it, but admires it. I mean, it just, I'm like, hmm, but Brittany, don't you understand? Like you were the princess of pop. You had your own clout. People don't, you don't, you don't have to take it from people, but she doesn't get that. I mean, she, t she seems to have no conceptualization of her own success. Yeah, I mean, she goes on to say, people kept calling me the princess of pop, um, but I don't think she felt that because what she really felt was all the negativity. She's starting to get some blowback now at this point. And for a people pleaser and for somebody who lives and dies on words of affirmation or the absence of affirmation, people's negativity is so loud. She can't hear the fact that she's popular. Doesn't matter that she's going on tours, selling out arenas, doesn't matter that she is making more money than she even knew it was possible to make. Doesn't matter that she's running in the same circles as all the most uh, famous celebrities in the musical world. Doesn't matter because all she can hear is the negativity she's starting to get. She says that at the 2000 VMAs, uh, she's saying the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction. And then oops, I did it again. While going from a suit and hat to a glittery bikini top and tight pants, my long hair down. Oh, and a bad girl Wade Robson choreographed it. He always knew how to make me look strong and feminine at the same time. During the dance breaks in the cage, I did poses that made me look girly in the middle of an aggressive performance. But she says later, MTV sat me down in front of a monitor and made me watch strangers in Times Square give their opinion on my performance. Some of them said I did a good job, but an awful lot of them seemed to be focused on my having worn a skimpy outfit. They said I was dressing too sexy and thereby setting a bad example for kids. The cameras were trained on me, waiting to see how I would react to this criticism, if I, if I could take it well, or if I would cry. Did I do something wrong? I wondered. I just danced my heart out on the awards show. I never said I was a role model. All I wanted to do was sing and dance. The MTV show host kept pushing. What did I think of the commenters telling me I was corrupting America's youth? Finally, I said, some of them are very sweet, but I'm not the children's parents. I just gotta be me. I know there are going to be people out there. I know not everyone's gonna like me, but it shook me up. And it was my first real taste of a backlash that would last years. It felt like every time I turned on an entertainment show, yet another person was taking shots at me saying I wasn't authentic. I never quite knew what all these critics thought I was supposed to be doing. A Bob Dylan impression? Why did everyone treat me, even when I was a teenager, like I was dangerous? This is what I mean when I say that she's constantly confused by the reaction she's getting from other people. For her, she's like, I just want to sing and dance. Did I do something wrong? But I don't understand how she's confused by this. She's coming out dressing like a little hoa. I mean, come on, Brittany, you have no clothes on. Like you, you've got like this little sparkly top, your midriff's out, you know, you're, you know, gyrating all over the place. I mean, for her to be like, I don't understand what's wrong. What, why don't people like that? I'm just dancing. I'm just trying to be me. You could just try to be you in your bedroom, but that's not really what you want either. I mean, you want the fame that comes with it. So, and, and with fame comes the fact that some people aren't going to like what you're putting out there. And I know she says, yeah, I know everyone's not going to like me, but she's confused why people don't, don't like it. And she doesn't seem to be able to connect the fact that what she's putting out there is sexual, it's tantalizing, it's, uh, 
It's not like it's it's like a lust generating performance. She acts like I just went out and did ballet, and I don't understand why anybody has a problem with that. No, you're dancing in a cage. I mean, it's all just very stripper vibes here. Like, I just feel like there's genuine confusion and and like a disconnect as to why people are viewing her as a sexualized object when she is presenting herself as that. You know, she's coming out. You know barely any clothes on gyrating across the stage dancing in cages you know putting her body on display and then being like oh, just sucks everyone thinks i'm just a sex object but i'm like are you actively trying to make people think you aren't like why can't people think that i'm smart are you showing them you're smart when do we ever get to see another side of you you're, you're performing songs begging for sex you're performing songs you know acting like, whoops, did it again. I mean, are these behaviors that seem intelligent? I'm not even saying Britney's not intelligent. I'm just saying, if you show everybody one side of you, you can't be offended that they don't assume the other side of you. So she goes on to say that she noticed more and more older men in the audience, and sometimes it would freak her out to see them leering at her like some kind of Lolita fantasy, especially when no one could seem to think of me as both sexy and capable or talented and hot. If I was sexy, they seemed to think I must be stupid. If I was hot, I couldn't possibly be talented. She says, I wish back then I'd known the Dolly Parton joke. I'm not offended by all the dumb blonde jokes because I know I'm not dumb. And I also know that I'm not blonde. My real hair color, said Brittany, is black. Trying to find ways to protect my heart from criticism and to keep the focus on what was important, I started reading religious books like the Conversations with God series by Neil Donald Walsh. And I also started taking Prozac. I mean, it's like, that's like the end of the chapter. It's like a bombshell comment slash throwaway comment. Who prescribed it? What were the events leading up to getting on Prozac? You know, was it just like somebody scrawled you a prescription and you just started taking it? Was there any guidance there? What, where, who were your medical professionals saying, you know, we think that this is what you need to do. What, what a band-aid solution on a life problem. Her entire world is chaotic. Everything about her life is wild. And instead of being like, hey, we need to take things down a notch or we need to like maybe get you a life coach like me, maybe get you a counselor or a therapist, like something, mm, Prozac. Just give her Prozac. We gotta keep, you know, get the show on the road, literally. And I just think it's crazy. Okay, that's the end of that chapter. We're gonna continue on. Uh, chapter 11. Now, it should be noted that Brittany in all of her success is now a household name. And in fact, she's making so much money that she ends up paying for all of her father's, get, gets him out of debt. He's in a mountain of debt. She takes care of that and she buys the family a home. So she is trying to take care of her family. She's trying to stay on top. She's like this household name. You know, she was performing at the Super Bowl now. She's on the Forbes list of most powerful celebrities. Um, on the next the next year, she was the number one overall on the Forbes list. She's just constantly making headlines um, at the 2001 MTV Video Music Awards. She is singing, I'm a slave for you. Again, not exactly the title of a song that's gonna make one think of you as an intellectual. And this time she's got a prop that is a, an actual snake. You know, and this iconic moment she said was so terrifying for her. And who among us has not seen the photo of Britney Spears at the MTV Music Awards with that huge giant yellow white snake? It's like everything, she was constantly topping the last thing she'd done. All eyes were always on her to see what she was going to do next. She says, the first time I saw the snake was when they brought it to a little back room of the Metropolitan Opera House in Manhattan, where we would be doing the show. The girl who handed it over to me was even smaller than me. She looked so young and was very tiny with blonde hair, and I couldn't believe they didn't have some big guy in charge. I remember thinking, you're letting us two little munchkins handle this huge snake? But there we were, and there was no going back. She lifted up the snake and put it over my head and around me. To be honest, I was a little scared. That snake was a huge animal, yellow and white, crinkly, gross looking. It was okay because the girl who gave it to me was right there, plus a snake handler and a bunch of other people. Everything changed though when I actually had to do the song on stage with the snake. On stage, I was in performance mode. I'm in a costume and there's nobody else there but me. Once again, the little munchkin came to me, handed me that huge snake, and all I knew was to look down because I felt like if I looked up and caught its eye, it would kill me. In my head, I was just saying, just perform, just use your legs, perform. But what nobody knows is that as I was singing, the snake brought its head right around to my face, right up to me and started hissing at me. You didn't see that shot on the TV, but in real life, I was thinking, are you effing serious right now? The effing snake's tongue is flicking out at me right now. 
Finally, I got to the part where I could hand it back. Thank God. Do you see what I'm saying? Brittany's really funny in this. I mean, it's a funny book. It's a, it's a good read. Um, and I just think, I mean, it's just wild. She's going from that and then she's going over to the Pepsi commercials and now she's the face of Pepsi and she's doing a whole series of, of commercials for them. There are, there's no name that she can't work with now. She's, she just finished doing a performance with Michael Jackson for the 30th anniversary of his solo career. You know, so it's like, there's no name that's too big for her to stand next to, but she doesn't even get that. I mean, she doesn't feel that. For her, she's just like this little girl from Louisiana who's still trying to make it, you know, it still thinks that she is the least important person in the room. And it's not because I think that she's necessarily so humble. I think it's because she really doesn't believe. Because humility, I think, is born from the fact that you could be proud of yourself and make everybody bow down to you and be a diva, but you choose not to because what's the point of that? Like, humility comes from when you could be a big deal and you choose not to act like it. What she's experiencing is not humility, it's degradation. It's so many years of feeling degraded by her family, by her own mental thoughts, um, shame, both from her family and both from the sense that, you know, I, maybe I didn't do the right thing here. Constantly, the little voice in her head saying, work harder, work harder, you're not enough, you know, and, and having that reinforced by actual people in her life. That she walks into a room and doesn't think that she's as good as everybody else. And that's not humility. Like I said, that's degradation from years of feeling small. And there's no amount of success that's going to help her to realize that she is, she actually has value because she needs to have somebody explain that to her. She's not gonna come to that conclusion on her own at this point. Because here she is having had massive success and she can't feel it. 